<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, Adam, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right. I hear you. Yep, you're good. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the third webinar in our 2021 Spring Turkey Field Pork Webinar Series. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if I can have a couple of those lentils pouches. Oh, hey, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Let's make sure you are muted, oh, okay. please. And then this, I tried to do that. There we go. Like I can mute people too. Uh, and happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, hope you're getting to, you get a chance to, to celebrate whatever that celebration looks like for you during, during a global pandemic. Hope it's a safe one and you have, enjoy yourselves. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, remember, as I've said before, this, this information we're presenting is going to be live on, or is live now on YouTube. We are uh, gearing all this information to new and beginner hunters. So if you've never turkey hunted before, if you've never cleaned a turkey before, if you've never cooked wild game meat before, well, this, this webinar series is for you. If you're just now joining us on Zoom and you have questions, you'll be able to drop them in the chat. And uh, at the end, we'll have a, a question and answer session. But in the meantime, please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted until we get to, to the Q&A down the road. Make sure if you haven't already that you put your first and last name and where you're from in the chat as well. That'll help us out and help us even more if you do the post webinar survey when I send it to you tomorrow, please. And that way we'll be able to make sure we do this better in the future. One last reminder before I introduce our presenters. Uh, again, this is being streamed on, on YouTube. So please help us uh, keep the presentation G-rated. My name is Brent McCarty. I'm, the R3, I'm, a, I'm an R3 specialist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I have the pleasure of introducing a couple guys that really I just met uh, uh, on Monday. Wasn't it Adam and Levi? I think we were Monday. Mm -hmm. Met virtually. Yep, yep. Uh, Monday. Had a good old time and I'm confident we'll have a good time again tonight and, uh, and learn a lot as well. So I'm going to introduce both of you. And then if I miss anything, y'all, y'all feel free to add it in there. Uh, Levi Berg is a extent for agriculture and natural resources in Henry County, Kentucky. He grew up hunting and fishing in West Virginia since he was young and uh, never misses a chance to get in the woods. boy. Adam Huber, uh, as an outdoor enthusiast, wildlife manager, hunter, education, excuse me, instructor, and an avid hunter, Adam spends a lot of his time as the University of Kentucky Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Allen County, producing educational programming about agriculture, wildlife, and wildlife habitat management. He has been in the turkey woods since he was seven years old, where he learned the ropes from his father at a young age. Adam also hosted a local nationally televised outdoor hunting show. For him, the enjoyment of spring turkey woods comes from the chess match between hunter and the wild turkey, along with time well spent with family and friends. For him, other than the reward of outwitting a smart old long beard, he claims that the real prize is the fresh organic meat that you possess with a successful harvest. And with that, speaking of a successful harvest, I think we're rolling right into Adam's portion which is what you do after the successful harvest. So Adam, I am going to stop my video, pin your video, and let you take it away. All right, Brent, well, I appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Again, my name is Adam Huber, and I am the University of Kentucky uh, Extension, uh, Agriculture Extension Agent in Allen County. And uh, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video. So I pre-recorded a video for you guys just to make it a little bit more high quality and a little better learning for you all. And this video is in two parts. We're going to spend the first 20 minutes diving right in and, and processing a turkey, cutting up, cutting out, uh, cutting the breast out, taking the legs out and, and getting our meat, meat out of the bird. And then the, the final six minutes of this video will be, uh, we're going to show you all how to take off the beard, take off the bread, or take off the and take off the tail fan. Um, so that that's kind of how it's going to going to roll tonight. Um, after that first twenty minute video, what I'm going to do is just take uh, a few questions uh, at that at that point before we roll into the actual uh, taking the beard and the and the fan off. 
um, just to make it a little bit easier for you guys. And then after the, the final six minute video, then at the very end, before Levi does his uh, demonstration, uh, we can take a few more questions as well. So. Hello everyone, my name is Adam Huber. I'm the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Agent for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Allen County, Kentucky. And welcome to this segment of Field to Forks Turkey proce Processing. So today what I'm gonna be teaching you all is how to, once you've harvested your turkey, we've had a lot of great um, speakers before tonight, and uh, you should have learned how to call in your turkey, where to hunt, where to set up, all that good stuff. But once you've actually um, harvested your bird, we need to know what to do with it. And so that's what I'm gonna be teaching you all tonight. Uh, we actually do have a turkey here. This is a domesticated turkey from a turkey farm. Um, it's obviously not turkey season yet, so we weren't uh, able to get a, uh, a wild turkey, but this one will, this one will do. Um, I just like to go over the materials that you're gonna need, the tools that you're gonna need, before you even start thinking about cutting up your turkey. Um, the first thing you're gonna need is a good set of knives. Um, this here, this is what I use. These are my personal set of, of hunting knives. This is an Outdoor Edge brand. I'm not promoting them in any way, but they are really, really good, uh, very sharp and dependable. I've had these for, I think, probably four or five years. And um, with a, a set of knives like this, you can see that it comes with four different knives. You get a, a knife sharpener, you get a cutting board. Pull that out, get a cutting board. Got some instructions as well. And then you've got, um, you got gloves, you got some snips, a boning knife, and then a breast uh, plate separator for, for like white-tailed deer. Um, and so there's a lot of different items here that you can use and basically you don't need anything else other than what is in this um, to, to uh, process your, your wild game. So that's what, that's what you need as far as your knives go, a good set, uh, set of sharp knives. You're gonna need a pan, some type of pan, bowl, uh, meat tub, whatever, uh, anything that you can find uh, to put your meat in, uh, your breast meat in, uh, once you do uh, get that cut up. You're gonna need um, some uh, bags. These are just plastic bags, Ziploc bags. Use those for storing your meat after you've got it cut up, <clears throat> got it sliced in the, the slices that you want. Um, so, so you're gonna need that to, to store it in. And so that's pretty much all the tools that you're gonna need. Um, so what we'll do now is get right into uh, slicing up our, or processing our turkey here. Okay, before we get started, we wanna make sure that we do have some rubber gloves on or any kind of gloves. Um, that way you don't get your, uh, for sanitation purposes and so you don't get your hands dirty. And for, for this part of processing the turkey, I like to use a boning or fillet knife. Um, as you can see here, it's got a thin, thin blade on it. Um, you can see there that it, you know, it's not, not really tough, not a really tough blade. And so you can, whenever we start cutting our, our meat out, um, it's got a little bit of flex to it. Um, with this set here, uh, this set of knives, there's a caping knife, there's a skinning knife, and there's a butcher knife. So that's one important thing is to, to choose the right blade uh, for uh, processing our turkey. So what we're gonna do is, before we get started um, on our cutting, we wanna make sure that the turkey's feet are facing, facing us. So basically you want your feet facing you just like that, where this, where this breast is just right in front of you. And so with this domestic turkey, it's, it's just a little bit different because there's not a lot of feathers here. Um, but if this were a wild turkey, you'd have feathers that would come here just like this. So just pretend my, my hands are feathers. And you'd see just a little bit of a bald spot right here. That's where, that's where that uh, breast bone or kill, they call it a kill bone, is located. So basically what I want to do is make an incision, make sure your knife is sharpened make an incision there and I like to kind of push down on it keep my, my blade right there where that bone is and then just glide my knife down. You don't want to cut too deep um, you just want to glide right over it and just get enough uh, uh, 
uh, get your blade deep enough where it just cuts that, that top layer of skin there. And you just go right down there. And so now, with this particular bird, it's been frozen, um, so it may be just a little bit more difficult, but now all you have to do basically is just take your hands and just rip it apart. Rip that skin, pull that skin apart. Really easy. This bird here, is st his, his, his breast uh, meat is still cold from, from being frozen. So that's, you're just gonna keep pulling your skin on both sides. And what I like to do is take here on the legs, just push them down. You can see, it, you can hear it kind of popped and there's a joint where the legs attach. It, it pops those joints out. And so now your legs are not flopping up here uh, in, in your way. Just gonna cut that a little bit there, get that out of the way. So now basically all we're gonna do, you have two sides, you have two sides of your meat. Um, this is your breastbone or keel bone. Basically all you're gonna do is you're gonna just make an incision at the top here and go right across the top of that. That This bone in here is solid all the way down. You're just gonna glide your knife right across it. So now that you've got this um, separated, this here is like the tenderloin of your turkey. So like you, you, you know the tenderloin of a deer, this is like the tenderloin of your turkey. So basically all you're gonna do just put your knife against that bone, that keel bone, and just glide it right down. You're separating that meat from the bone. Sometimes the uh, this piece of meat here comes off with the whole uh, breast, this whole side of your breast, or you can cut it off separately, it doesn't really matter. Basically you're just gonna glide your knife. You don't wanna stab down deep, because if you, right in here, you get down into uh, the turkey's crawl, crawl area. You don't wanna get into that, uh, get guts and, uh, you know, what the, what the turkey's been eating. Uh, you don't wanna get that onto your meat that you're actually trying to get off. You're just gonna slice that down. You can see here, this is where the turkey's gizzard and crawl is. You don't wanna get any of that, so you're just gonna cut around that. You're just gonna, and you can see, you can see here we've got just a little bit left. You can see that, this is the skin, this is your meat. Just gonna glide your blade across. And there's one side of your one side of your breast. And there's your tenderloin. So that's your tenderloin there, that little thin thin piece. And this is the rest of your breast. So that's one side of your, of our turkey done. We're gonna put it in our pan over here. And then we'll move to the other side. Again, we'll just make an incision here. We'll just glide our blade right across that breast or keel bone. You can see that opens up real nice. You can see that tenderloin right there. You can just take your finger and, and separate that tenderloin. And it's real easy. Slide your blade crossed. And you can see, you can kind of visualize here, this, this bone, this breastplate or keel bone, it goes down and it goes, you can kind of see where 
where you need to follow. There's basically a line right there. And you can, if you wanted to, you can go ahead and, and make a slice up and down that. Just to separate that skin. And you go back up here and you just start slicing down. And you get a nice clean cut there. You see there's not any meat really. Maybe just a little right there, but that right there is your bone. You hear that? That's your bone. That's what you're that's what you're gliding your knife down. Make sure not to get your get your crawl in your gizzard area. We'll make sure you cut that out. You get down here to the bottom, you just want to cut straight across. And there you go. There you have it. There's your tenderloin piece and the rest of your breast. It's pretty simple. Um, we'll go ahead and put that in our uh, bowl here. As you can see, that meat, there's just a little bit of, I think it's just where a little bit of dirt and stuff got off the, uh, the feathers there. Um, like I said, this is a domesticated animal. Um, but pretty clean meat there whenever you cut it off. There's not a lot of blood at all. Um, what you need to do now, you know, after you get that cut, is just cut your slices, however you want it sliced up. Um, and of course, obviously, you'd want to wash it and clean it up, um, but pretty, pretty clean. So now what we'll do, since we've got our breast meat out, is some folks will eat the legs and some folks will not. Um, this here, this breast meat is your white meat. It's good for, for frying. Um, it's more of your tender type meat. These leg, this leg muscle, these leg, uh, the leg meat is more, um, it's more tough, it's tougher. Uh, it's more for like your stews, casseroles, things like that is what you would use your, your leg meat for. Um, what we're gonna do before we get, actually take our leg meat off is we're gonna cut our feet off. So typically, you know, if we've shot a turkey in the spring, you know, a gobbler is gonna have big spurs and, he, and you may wanna use uh, the, you may wanna hang these up, you know, for uh, in your trophy room, or you can also cut the feet off and use as a scratching tool for like whenever you're hunting, um, just as another call. Um, a few different things that you can do. Some folks, like you can see this little nub spur here, not very big at all. Uh, but if this was a big long big gobbler uh, that you killed you know a wild turkey you know he would have uh, big spurs on him if it was a, a tom uh, if it was a jake he's obviously going to have these small small spurs um, but some folks you'll see they'll take like a, a a saw and they'll cut them off here and cut them off here and then they'll just have the short uh, section of the leg there where their spurs are that's not what we're going to do um, what we're going to do is we're going to take our knife and you can see there's the, the leg bends here. Um, there's a joint right here. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna go where that joint is and we're gonna cut. We're gonna slice that. We're just gonna pop that out. And you'll have to cut around it. And there's our leg. Now you can hang that up. Uh, put it in your trophy room or like I said you can use that as a another calling uh, tool. We're going to go over here on the other side do the same thing make a cut right there. I don't know if you can see that you're just going to take a cut that then you're going to use a little bit of muscle and you're going to pop it. You can see that joint there just comes right out. There's a little tendon there cut that then we're going to cut around Now we've taken our second leg off. 
Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and if we were wanting to save our legs uh, to eat those, basically all you do now is take and just uh, remove that skin. So we're gonna go up here on the top, we use the tip of our knife, make an incision. Let's go right down that leg. Let's get it where you can peel that skin back. And whenever we started, I mentioned that we we uh, we push down on our legs and it pops this joint out. So that does make it a lot easier to uh, get your legs off. Basically, you're gonna gonna do the same thing that you were that you do whenever you are getting your breast meat out. You're just gonna take this skin. This one's a little bit tough because it's been frozen. You're just gonna pull the skin. There we go. Now you can see there, that right there's that joint. Where I said we pop, pushed our legs down and pops that joint out. So now all we need to do is cut down. You can kind of see there's a line right there. Cut down that line. Pull the skin down a little more. It's one thing whenever you're doing this, you want to make sure that you get all the skin removed. You don't want to cook any of that. Just going to cut that. And there's our leg. Now you can, um, got a little bit of extra stuff up here, we'll cut this off. Now, with, um, with your legs, now you can go ahead and debone them um, and put them in your, whatever, whatever recipe that you're gonna use, you can go ahead and, uh, like I said, you can debone this leg meat. This is, like I said, this is your darker meat. If you kind of look here at the difference, it's kind of hard to tell because this is a little bloody, but you can see the difference between this is your leg meat this is your breast meat, dark meat, white meat. Let's go ahead and throw that one in there. We'll go ahead and do our second one. We'll do this one just a little bit, di little bit different just to show you another way as far as getting the skin off. The last one I started up here where we cut the leg off. This one I'm just gonna start down here at the bottom and just make my slice going up. You wanna make, you don't wanna press down on it really hard because you don't want to cut into your meat. You just want to kind of get your fingers in under the skin, lift it up, and then just glide your knife blade across. We're just going to peel our skin off, or peel it, peel it down, I should say. This one here, I'm gonna have to pull this side down a little more. We're just gonna take our knife here. You can see our line. I'm just gonna separate that skin. As you can see on this one, here's where we pushed our legs down at the beginning. Pop that joint out right there. There's that joint ball. We're just gonna take our knife and cut right through there.
we go. We've got our second leg taken off. A little bit dirty. And that's pretty much the process of taking your meat out. Um, like I said, your, your leg meat, your dark meat, it's going to be more for your stews, your casseroles, things like that. Your, dark, your white meat um, is your, is your uh, more preferred meat. Some folks, like I said, they don't even take the legs out just because they are a little bit more tough. With the way that the bird is physically made up, that, uh, that meat is just naturally going to be going to be tougher. So that's pretty much that part of our um, taking our meat out. And so what I'm going to do now is show you how to take the fan off and take the beard off um, if you wanted to uh, have a have a like a, a fan mount. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take off the fan, which as you all can see, this one has a big, beautiful, pretty fan on it. <laughs> but, and uh, we're going to take off the beard also. Um, so basically what we're going to do, um, of course, you know, obviously if we have killed a wild turkey, it's going to have a big, pretty fan on it um, that you can spread out and, and display on your wall. Um, or just take off to use as a decoy for, use it, uh, for a decoy. Um, lots of different uses for the tail fans. You can take the feathers out and you uh, make like pins out of them. Lots of different uses for for the tail fan and then <clears throat> the beard also. So basically what we're going to do, and we'll set this turkey up just like this. And if what you're going to do is, if you can see, you may have to scoot in a little. Um, Basically, you can take your hand right here, this right above his rear, and you can you can see that it, it's kind of kind of loose right here. There's a there's a bone that goes up through here, and that's where he uses his muscles to expand his fan and and and, and things like that. So basically, what we're going to do, you can see there, all you have to do is squeeze it, and you can feel this muscle uh, in here, and you can feel how uh, the muscles get real thin. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take our knife. We're just going to we're just going to slice right through here, and you can see there that right there is just a this skin basically that that muscle is real thin. We're just going to slice over to the side on the sides. Get down to, to there. And basically what we're gonna do now is we're gonna come up here on the front and get however many feathers you want in your display um, and grab those feathers. And basically you're just gonna slice right across. And there's our fan. This one ain't very uh, eye appealing, but that's how you do it. And, and what you wanna do now, since you've got it got your fan cut off um, you can go ahead and trim as you can see there's a lot of there's some excess meat on here you can go ahead and you can kind of trim that up and um, if you were wanting to do like a home mount yourself you would basically spread your fan out turn it this way so you can see it a little better spread your fan out and then of course this one's not going to cooperate but you would spread your fan out and then you would pin it to like a piece of cardboard and then you'd also put salt and or borax uh, on the the back part where you where your meat would be um, of course like i said you're going to cut this most of this excess off but you will have some left um, and you just put salt and borax on that and then you hang it up to dry um, for you know a few weeks and then you can it'll it'll uh, stay there um, kind of uh, and then, then you would go ahead and take your pins out, and then you can put it on a plaque, um, or like I said, you can use it as a as a fanning decoy, um, put it on the back of a decoy, whatever you want to use that for. Um, but that's basically what you do with your fan. Now, now we're going to take off the beard. Um, so a lot of folks don't know that you can do this. So most typically, you're going to see somebody take their knife. They're just going to hunk this beard off they're just going to take it and cut it off they'd cut it off just like that but what you can do if you 
if you use your knife and cut this off, you're, it's just going to be like this tail fan. You're going to have a lot of excess meat is what you're going to have. And you're going to have to put salt and borax on it also. But what you can do, the, this beard is just like these feathers. These feathers, you can pluck these out. So basically, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to grab our beard. We're not going to yank every little piece out. But what we're going to do is grab our beard. We're just going to kind of pinch it with our left hand. And then we're just going to kind of pull it. And you can see there, it comes off real clean and you don't have any excess meat or anything like that. So now you can just go ahead and display that um, with your with your mount with your fan here. Like I said, th doing it this way, you don't have the extra meat that's on there. You don't have to put anything on it, uh, such as borax or salt. Um, and so you can do lots of different things with these. Now, if you're wanting to fully mount a turkey, like a full body mount, what you're going to need to do is um, you're going to need to take the whole turkey to your taxidermist. You don't want to you don't want to cut any of the meat off of it. You don't want to do anything with it. Um, and so basically, they're going to cut the the meat out of themselves uh, because there's a certain way that you have to that, that they would have to cut and, um, for restitching and things like that whenever they go to go to mount it. So, like I said, um, but if you're just going to do it yourself, this is the way to go. Then you've got your spurs, you've got your beard, and you've got your fan. Um, that that's that's basically it when it comes to the uh, getting your beard and your fan off. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's session. I'm just going to go over just uh, a couple things uh, to wrap up. Um, basically, what we want to do after we got our meat um, taken out of our bird, we want to make sure that we clean all the feathers off if there is any feathers that uh, do get attached to your meat clean those off wash the wash your meat in water um, and, and just make sure that it's all sanitized and before you go to uh, put it into your bags just make sure your meat is dry just set it uh, just set it aside separate your meat out let it dry itself off and then go ahead and put it in your in your ziploc bags and what you're going to need to do is uh, Put your confirmation number on the bag, uh, each package of that you're going to put your meat in. Put your confirmation number that you get once you call your bird in, and also the date that you killed that bird, and then also probably um, just write on there what cut of meat that is, so you know uh, once you pull that out of the freezer. And so that's basically what you what you need to know as far as processing your turkey. Um, if you are going to uh, process your turkey in the field, um, like I said. You don't necessarily have to have a fillet knife. Um, that's just what I like to use because, you know, they they have a good thin blade, flexible. Uh, you can use, you know, uh, other types of knives. Um, and also, if you're going to uh, process your turkeys in the field, it might be a good idea to have a cooler with some ice nearby, um, especially, you know, later on up in April. It typically gets pretty warm throughout the day. So if you kill one in the morning time and you and your buddies are hunting together and you're, and you're going to keep after them, Go ahead and put that bird into a freeze, into a cooler uh, with some ice on it, and, and just keep that meat cool because uh, you definitely don't want to uh, want your meat to ruin. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Um, appreciate everyone watching the video, and I hope all of you have learned uh, something about processing turkeys, and and also just uh, throughout this whole whole series of videos, uh, we've had some great speakers, and uh, I think this is a a very educational program for you and your family. If you do have any questions, you can contact uh, myself on the processing and any other questions also, or you can contact the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, we'd be definitely glad to help you. Good. Um, I do have some questions. Um, and if you want to, Adam, go ahead and start your video back up, or your, um, you know, so we can see you, and I will spotlight you. There you are. Well, almost had you. Oh. All right. There you are. Okay. We did have one early on. Uh, does it make a difference if you pluck the feathers before cutting out the meat? 
Um, this particular way, no, you can pluck the feathers out. Um, but if you're just going to be debreasting the bird, um, there's not really a point in, in taking all the feathers out. Um, now, if you're going to cook the whole bird, uh, you know, kind of like you would buy like a Thanksgiving turkey at the store, if you're wanting to do it that way, um, then yeah, you would want to you would want to plug it and 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 there's a different way of processing it. You know, if you are going to do that, um, but with this the way that we're we're processing this particular bird, no, you wouldn't really want to uh, waste your time, honestly, plucking all the feathers out. I've never done it myself, but I'm under the impression that it is quite time consuming to pluck a bird, correct? Oh yeah, for sure. I've did it like once. <laughs> Just to say you had, right? right. Uh, we got a, uh, another question. What about removing the gizzard, liver, and heart for giblet gravy? Yeah, so that you're going to get into, uh, you know, which I guess I should have shown that uh, on the video, um, but a, a lot of folks don't use those uh, particular organs. Um, but if you did want to take those out, um, you just have to get down deeper into the where I talked about the crawl and the gizzard area on the video. You just have to, uh, you know, cut down into the inside, the internal of, the, of that bird and, and, and get those out that way. Um, like I said, it's kind of hard to explain without, you know, physically being able to see that. Um, but like I said, you'd have to definitely um, get get into inside of the bird to do that. And and folks, I've mentioned this in the chat earlier. I'll mention it again. I will. Uh, I'll share that uh, Adam's original YouTube video with you, so you'll be able to watch it seamlessly uh, as well. So one other yes. question: What breed of turkey was it, and was the turkey already gutted? So. I'm not sure what actual breed this turkey was. Um, it, it came from the fishing department of fish and wildlife. And they, I think they uh, got those from a turkey farm. Um, and as far as it being gutted, no, the, the turkey was basically like, if you went out in, in the wild and shot a turkey, that's the way that we received this bird. So it was whole, there was nothing cut off of it. Um, so it was, it was the way that you would find one if you shot one. Just, uh, just frozen ones. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it was frozen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Frozen and thawed. Uh, any waiting period from the time you take the turkey to the time you cut it up? Uh, do you need to let its body temperature lower? Anything like that? Um, I don't think so. <clears throat> my my FCS says it would probably be the better, <laughs> better person to answer that question. But as far as, uh, as, far as the body temperature and stuff, um, no, I don't think that there is a waiting time that you need to wait. Um, now, if you killed one, you know, and, and it was hot weather outside, you would definitely want to get that the bird either on ice or get it processed in a pretty pretty fast time um, just so that that meat doesn't ruin. Um, but that would be the only way, that would be the only time that I would want to hurry up and, and get it, you know, get it processed as quickly as you can. Um, but like I say, if you can get it in a freezer or in a cooler of some type, um, you know, and just get that meat cooled, cooled and chilled, uh, then you, there's no certain time um, that you have to wait. Obviously, you don't want to leave it in there for four or five days because, you know, that just wouldn't be wouldn't be good. But, uh, yeah, just get to it as quick as you can. And, and like I say, if it's if it's hot out, uh, don't don't wait too long. One one more, and we'll jump on to the next uh, portion of your video there. Should you soak the meat overnight prior to freezing, in, let's say in salt water or something like that? You don't have to, but you can. Um, that's really, you know, your preference. Um, a, a lot of folks, even even like with, with venison meat, some folks, you know, they want to get that gamey taste out, so they'll soak it in milk overnight. It really just depends on what your preference is. You can soak it, um, but it's not really necessary. <clears throat> okay, so Adam, uh, we, the way you pulled the beard out, um, do you still have to let it dry when you pull it out that way? Or, uh, I know you said you don't have to have salt or borax, but did you have to, uh, did you have to get any drying time when you pulled it out that way? Uh, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to, 
you know, put it up on, on your wall as a display. You can, you can let it dry, you know, for a couple hours, but really there's not, uh, not a lot, a long time for that. Uh, just because there's not a lot of meat attached, there's actually no meat attached to it, the way that you pull it out like that. So really there's not, you know, any drying time with that, but, you know, obviously you're going to have to let your, your fan dry for a couple of weeks, um, you know, with that borax and salt on it. So it's a good idea just to set that aside, you know, with your fan and just let it all, let it all do its thing until you're actually ready to, uh, to get it mounted. Uh, which brings us to our next question. Somebody asked, uh, what, what do you do with the fan once it's cut out? There, there's a, you know, there's a few things that you can do with the fan. Um, like I mentioned in the video, you can uh, display it on your wall. You can, uh, they make plaques that you can display those on your wall with your beards and your spurs. Um, you can take the, the, t the tail feathers out and you make, uh, make pins out of those. Um, I've seen folks take the tail feathers out and do paintings on them. Um, you can, you can use them for your, on your decoys. Um, you know, if you've got like a Jake or a Tom decoy, you can put them on the back of those. So there's, there's a lot of different things that you can uh, use those tail fans for. And uh, well, that's, I think the last of the questions, but we've got a couple people saying, thank you. A couple people saying excited to try, uh, have, have tried to process birds in other ways and, and uh, are, are thankful or looking forward to trying a, a different way. So, uh, and I echo them too, Adam, thank you. And uh, you are sticking around for afterwards if we have more questions, right? Yes, I will be here to the end of the uh, end of the night if anybody has any other questions. Um, again, I appreciate everyone watching and I do apologize for the choppiness of the video, but uh, uh, we will try to get that sent out to you guys so you can watch it in full if you you'd like to do that. Um, so again, I appreciate everyone uh, attending tonight. You are the man, Adam. I don't care what Levi says about you. <laughs> Gotta watch that guy. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Levi, I guess he's next. Levi, do you want me to spotlight you or your uh, table? Uh, go ahead and spotlight me. Okay. All right. I'm Levi Berg, and I'm the extension agent here in Henry County. Uh, kind of like the beginning, I've kind of grown up eating especially wild game. <laughs> and there was really two meals, me and my two brothers, we basically fought over. That was that first pan of fried deer meat and the first pan of um, trout, well, fried trout. So anyways, I've been eating wild game for a long, long time. So I was asked to try to see if I could tell a little bit about cooking. And probably the first two things I ever hear someone say about cooking, especially wild game, is one, it's dry. Uh, no matter what, I hear it, someone say that wild game is dry. And two, it, it tastes gamey. And frankly, I kind of dismiss both of these, mainly because, kind of like Adam said, a lot of, well, your meat prep, as soon as you shoot that bird, really should start. Actually, you should be planning on shooting your turkey probably the night before, before you even get in the woods. Get that meat cooled down as quick as possible and you're gonna have a better product. The second, when it comes down to dryness, is these are gonna be your best friend. They're thermometers. Wild game can dry out and it's usually because of overcooking and it's just, a thermometer, especially this one, it is just a instant read stick thermometer. This one, like if you're roasting the turkey breast, you put it into the oven and I'll actually be using this here in a second. You insert the probe into the turkey breast. Sorry, this one's kind of dingy. It's been in the smoker for a little while. But anyways, you put that probe into the uh, turkey breast, put it in the oven, and then this is just kind of a, well, communicator with this. So all this really does is I can set this about 30 to 40 feet away from this, which is fantastic because my smoker is downstairs about 30 feet. So I can sit it by the TV and see what temperature my meat's going. So with just these simple principles, 
don't overcook and get that meat cooled down as quick as possible, you're going to have a much better presentation. Um, put it this way, I'm close to eating probably 30 to 40 percent wild game as compared to meat purchased from the store. Me and my wife, we love deer, but turkey is one of those things we don't get very often, but it's always a joy when we start. So, Brett, if, well, this will be the recipe we'll be using today, and let me try to bring that up. All right, so everyone should see this. This is the Cook Wild Kentucky, and these are recipes that pretty much every extension office, they should have some. And if not, you can also go on to our website. Um, actually, let me share that website here in a second. So if you go to the website, Plan, Eat, Move, this is where you can find this recipe. And this recipe will be a wild turkey and broccoli casserole. And honestly, when I get my bird, the first thing I want is probably a roasted turkey breast. So that's where I'm probably just gonna be very simple, like salt, pepper, um, maybe basil, a little bit of butter, pop it in the oven, use a instant read thermometer or a cooking probe that I can leave in the bird. And as soon as it hits 165 degrees, pull it. And the one thing I will say with thermometers, you need to calibrate every thermometer. This one's actually reading, I want to say three or four degrees low. And you can find instructions on that about anywhere. But jumping back, um, how I like to roast the turkey breast, frankly, I'm thinking of things what to do after that first initial meal. And this casserole is fantastic is it extends your turkey breast more than one meal. Frankly, me and my wife will maybe eat a pound, pound and a half of turkey breast at dinner. Well, we need to figure out what to do later on. So this casserole is going to be a fantastic option for that. So, Brett, if you want to spotlight my camera looking down, we'll get started with the recipe. It is done. All right, can everyone see right through here? Yes. All right, I'm trying, I've kind of, I have cameras rigged up with duct tape and everything else trying to get the right uh, views. So this right here, it is a domestic turkey breast and it came right out of the freezer section. So right out of the freezer section, I cooled it down. It did have some seasoning on the outside and I washed it off just because it was, I forget what type of seasoning it was, but with this casserole, you really do not want a whole lot of seasoning on the outside of it, mainly because that cream of mushroom soup, um, it will, it has uh, quite a bit of uh, salt in it and other spices. So, First thing to do is when you get your turkey breast, you can see the line coming down. You can see the muscle fibers. So this will be like what is on the inside. Actually, it should be this way. This right here will be along the wing. This is the back. This would be like running along the kill bone, and this would be close to the crop. So as you can tell when you flip it over, you have really long muscle fibers, and that comes into play after we actually cook this thing because these muscle fibers you really need to cut against the grain when you start really cooking but right now i like to use just a simple boning knife i think this is like a four inch boning knife and especially for wild turkey like adam said i like to get as much fat off of it as possible you can just well my knife was a little sharper, but you can see the little bit of fat that's around. Just take it, cut it off. You will have a little bit of a membrane that 
kind of get started. You can see it a little bit there, how it's kind of pulling away from the meat. Honestly, it's almost impossible to get that off. Um, so I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time. Just try to get the fat off of it when you can. So next thing, we're going to spray down our dish. And you can use Pam, olive oil, uh, vegetable oil, whichever. Uh, this is just Pam because I'm trying to get it quick. So for this recipe, all you need is garlic powder and black pepper on the outside of the meat. So put a pretty, you don't have to put a whole lot of black pepper, but definitely try to get all sides of the meat. And I'll flip it over here in a second. This is garlic powder. It just takes a very little bit of the garlic powder. As you can tell, it's just barely even sprinkling it on. Try to get all sides. And this is the tenderloin. Well, this is part of the tenderloin that Adam was talking about earlier. So after you flip it over, a little bit more garlic powder, a little bit more pepper, and it's ready to go in the dish. So get rid of these gloves. All right, ready for the oven. And due to the miracles of TV, I guess, this is what a cooked tur turkey breast is going to look like. And of course, before this recipe does call for everything to be cooked. So before I put on my clean gloves, I'm going to get rid of anything I touch with my bare hands. Or I had raw turkey on it. Put on a new pair of gloves. And I forgot my thermometer. I'll need to remember that before the turkey breast is done. But we'll set it off to the side. So, the recipe calls for four cups of turkey. So this is where I really, you need to look at how the muscle fibers actually go. Because everybody, especially like Thanksgiving, we think of you cut from that kill bone and you just slice down the side of the turkey and you get nice little pieces. But actually, if this was a full turkey breast, it would come out about this far. Up here would be the um, crop. Down here would be the wing. And as you can tell, the muscle fibers actually kind of run this way. So if you actually want to cut against the grain, you want to kind of cut, just make sure you get against the grain. And you can kind of see right there. So if you don't cut along the sternum, usually cut against the grain. So for this recipe, it does call for about four cups. Just make it into nice cubes. Uh, probably one more. So after you have that, keep cutting down into your cubes. And it doesn't really matter what size cubes you really want, but you really want to think about, you don't want them too big, you don't want them too small. Because if they're too small, they're liable to dry out in the casserole when you cook them. Or if they're too big, it may just be a little more difficult for someone to eat. So again, just keep cutting down in the smaller cubes. And again, if you're just cubing this, it doesn't make as much of a difference which way you're cutting that uh, with along the muscle fibers or against it. But 
Um, turkey breast is extremely, you can use it for a lot of different things. And one of the things I really like to do is just make turkey sandwiches. All right, we're right at about four cups. So we'll put that little bit back. And let's say I wanted to use this bit for like sandwiches. You can just take it, slice it thin. Just make sure you cut it against the grain. If you cut it against the grain, it's pretty tender. It just barely pulls apart. So again, there's a lot of things you can do. At this step, if you have more turkey breast like this, also you can dust it in uh, taco seasoning. You can make tacos from it. There's a, you pretty much name it. If you can do it with chicken, you can do it with wild turkey. The biggest thing, pull it out of the oven when it hits 160. Well, 165. So you know that it's done. So we'll move this out of the way. All right, now comes the fun part. So we have our turkey breast cut up. It's right here, four cups of it. Now we need to mix together kind of the filling. And this filling, uh, you may be able to see it on the camera. It's probably gonna be a little iffy, find that. But what you have is two cans of low sodium cream of uh, chicken soup, one cup of light mayonnaise, One tablespoon of prepared mustard, or you could substitute one teaspoon of curry powder, whichever. And one teaspoon of lemon juice. I mean, I'm sorry, one half teaspoon of lemon juice. So after you have that, those ingredients together, we can put the spatula off to the side. Just sit here, mix it real quick, and try to get a pretty good mix on it. Um, if not, it can, you want it to just be as consistent as possible. You don't have to ever mix it like throw it in a KitchenAid mixer or something. But you just want to mix it until it's nice and done. Well, it's even all the way through. And it also calls for two, um, fresh heads of broccoli, or you can use two 10 ounce packages of frozen broccoli. I prefer fresh. And all I did was I took the broccoli, cut it up in smaller florets, and then I blanched it. Um, it does say the steam for about five minutes or steam until tender. I actually like my broccoli with a little bit of crunch. So I pretty much just blanched it. Uh, rolling boil threw the broccoli in until it got vibrant green, pulled it out, and that was done. And this will come out to about eight cups of broccoli or so. So we have pretty much all of our, oh, one last set of ingredients. We'll do that after we put it together. So we have our nine by 13 casserole dish. Just give it a quick spray with Pam, I mean, a cooking spray, or you can use vegetable oil, olive oil, something like that. But first thing to do, take your turkey breast, put it into your nine by 13. Just kind of space out that turkey as much as you can to where it's nice and even. Now take your broccoli, Put it on top. And it will look like a lot of broccoli, um, but you can kind of push it down a little bit, try to make it as even as possible. All right, now after we have those, 
So we have our turkey on the bottom, broccoli up on top. Now is to take our mixture and just spoon it over the top. And I'm making a royal mess. So grab my spatula, just try to move the mixture down through the broccoli as much as possible. Because you can't really push it down, but if you take the side of the spatula and push down through, you can get a little more of that mixture down to the turkey when it goes to cook. So Again, just even it out. And last step is the topping. So move that off to the side. There's our topping. So the topping is going to be a half cup of cheddar cheese, a half cup of panko breadcrumbs, and about And it's going to be right, it's supposed to be melted butter, but I sat here long enough, it congealed a little. So, after you get that, take your, well, let me, so, after that, you just want to try to mix this around. You want to try to spread, get a good mixture between your panko breadcrumbs, your broccoli, I mean, your panko breadcrumbs, your cheddar cheese, and you want to get that butter mixed all the way around. So that looks pretty good. So now for the topping, just take a little bit, spread it over the top of the, our casserole. And it doesn't have to be extremely even. It just looks nicer if it is. So, after we have our casserole built, now it goes in the oven. All right. Let me clean up a little bit. And I'm quite sure my wife would be yelling at me right now to stop dirtying up the kitchen. But just try to clean everything up. We really appreciate all the dishes you're going to have to do later, Levi. Well, luckily I have a dishwasher. <laughs> so, next step. And again, with the miracle of TV. This is what your casserole would look like when you're done. And honestly, from this point, you could probably just dig into it with a fork and a spoon and be perfectly happy. But since I'm trying to be a little bit healthier, I have some fresh strawberries. All right. I have some fresh peas. And finally, our casserole. This casserole will feed about eight people. So, 
Just take it, spoon it onto the plate, and there you go. This is a plated version of our casserole, which is the wild turkey and broccoli casserole. And kind of like I stated before, this is probably a recipe I would use after I roasted the turkey breast or something along those lines. So again, this is just a good option in general for those leftovers. Now, when it comes to the legs, I personally like to make sausage. Uh, breakfast sausage, you can cut it with a little bit of bacon, grind it, um, it's fantastic. There's numerous recipes out there for it. So don't discard those legs and thighs. There's a lot of meat there. Out of a big tom, you may get anywhere close to three to five pounds of meat. Out of the breast, you may get five to six. So there's a lot of meat in those legs and thighs. Just don't pitch them. There's plenty you can do with it. Um, there was a question earlier. The gentleman asked, do you have to salt it, uh, salt water, um, while well, soaking in salt water before you freeze it? Personally, I like to soak while brine it. So I brine it before I cook it because that helps get more of that salt inside of the meat and it just makes a better product. Um, and it also helps season the meat all the way through. So you don't have to soak it in salt water, but I do it just because I'm trying to get some of that salt inside of the meat before I either smoke it or uh, roast the turkey breast. Now, if it's the, if I'm making sausage, I probably will not brine those legs and thighs just because I don't want them to be too salty. So I guess with that, are, is there any questions? Looks like we've got a couple already. First of all, though, just for me personally, Levi, you blew my mind with the calibrating the thermometer thing. I'm going to be looking that mm -hmm. up afterwards. I just recently got introduced to uh, thermometers for grilling, and it changed my mm -hmm. grilling for the better. And now I'm like, okay, now I gotta now I gotta calibrate the thing. I gotta figure so this out. The easiest way to calibrate is you can get a water boiling. Uh, I should remember this. It's been a long day. I want to say it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit for it to boil. Put your thermometer in and see what temperature it is. It may show that it's only 210 to 209. So that's saying that your thermometer is reading four degrees too low. And especially with wild game, five degrees makes a big difference between a medium steak, like when a deer, or potentially eating a raw turkey, I mean, an undercooked turkey breast where or turkey thigh to where you could get salmonella. So it's good to just see how your thermometers are working. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, for those of us that are a little uh, uh, challenged when it comes to the kitchen, can you give us a, a ballpark size, uh, kind of a size reference on those turkey cubes? Look to be about the size of dice, but I wasn't sure. Uh, they're probably close to, they're not an inch by inch. They're a little bigger than a half inch by half inch. Excellent. Let's see. Uh, how long do you typically brine your turkey meat? Uh, if I brine, it's going to be at least overnight. I don't like to go too terribly long um, just because it can get too salty. Um, and usually when I brine, it's, it's not like a true one-to-one -one or something like that. I fill it up with water. I put some salt over top of it just enough to where I want some of that flavoring to get in. Um, some of the old timers used to say, you soak in salt water, it's going to kill all the parasites in it or bacteria. And it may a little, but most of it is just flavoring the meat before you cook it, especially roasting. If you roast it, I highly recommend brining. And frankly, sometimes I just want a piece of fried turkey breast. And if you do that, just make sure to cut against the grain and you'll have a much tender bite instead of trying to chew through those muscle fibers. Sorry, I muted myself. Okay, very good. Thank you, Levi. Anybody else have any questions for, oh, here we go. Have you ever tried smoked turkey omelets? I have not. Um, I'm willing to try them though. <laughs> 
we're getting some uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Can you use any other seasoning while brining? Usually not really. Um, if you're going to smoke, you could put in a little bit of sugar, but make sure you have more salt than sugar because those flavors can flip flop pretty easy. Um, but honestly, most of the time it's just salt and water. It doesn't take a whole lot. Um, I've got a, I've got a non cooking question and, and, uh, uh, so maybe one for you and or Adam, either one. Uh, but first, a cooking question. Do you ever make, I assume, I assume this is like chicken nuggets, turkey nuggets. Is there, do you have a recipe yep. for turkey nuggets? Yep. Like I said, sometimes you just want something fried. And I'm not going to lie, that's one of those meals from that I remember being young. My dad, he kind of fried everything, but it was always delicious. All you have to do on the turkey breast, just cut them into smaller pieces. Still cut against the grain, but just cut them into smaller chunks. Bread them, fry them. They're always good. We'll say that is one thing that you folks at UK have done a fantastic job of is, yeah, those of us that grew up eating wild game, we grew up most of the time eating it fried, right? And, yep. and so finding healthy ways to... Well, to incorporate wild game is fantastic as well. And that's why I like this recipe so much is it's just, it's something else. It's lighter. It's not nearly as heavy as a fried steak. Now my wife, she's going to tell you there's nothing better than probably a deer fried, uh, well, chicken fried deer steak with some gravy. She may fight with me a little bit, but sometimes you just want something lighter that has green in it. And this is a prime example of what you can do. See, I've got another one here. Okay, so this is the non-cooking question. Uh, does anybody happen to know what uh, what spurs are made out of on a on a turkey? They're keratin, aren't keratin. they? I think it's keratin. Maybe keratin, just like our fingernails and feather and their feathers and our hair. And Adam, you're unmuted. Do you have uh, input on that? <laughs> no, I, I was just gonna say that you are. You all are correct on that they are made of keratin. Oh, it's made of what? Keratin. I actually looked it up just to make sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you all for answering that for me. Absolutely. Pretty tough it, stuff. That's what our fingernails are made out of. That's what um, uh, uh, horns on uh, on cattle are made out of. That's what, uh, well, I should have known that. Bird beaks are made out of keratin. Yeah, it's lots lots of things are made out of keratin. Uh, have you ever cooked an entire turkey as is, smoker or otherwise? I have not. Um, and I doubt if I probably ever will with a wild turkey, just because of how the structure of the bird is. Um, usually don't have, I feel like if you threw everything into a smoker, you would have to be very careful not to dry out certain parts, especially the legs. Legs seem to dry out pretty quick. Um, especially if they're ever cooked, they can get kind of rubbery. So I would rather park them out and do other specialties with them. Um, like I said, the turkey breast, it's probably going to be roasted and the thighs I'm probably making in the sausage or some type of, um, stew or something like that. Chris, but I apologize. It doesn't mean that you can't try. And I think the, the kicker with that would be uh, what you said earlier with, with wild game, just don't overcook it, right? Exactly. Chris, I apologize. Your question, uh, you might need to elaborate for me. Chris, are you able to, to turn your microphone on? Uh, yeah. Uh, what I was asking there, these little like red ball looking things on a Tom's throat, what do those do to the live bird? Or is there anything they do specifically? Or is that just for looks? Uh, there we go. Let's see. I can I can answer that one. Yeah, that's uh um well let me see if I've spotlighted my video here. 
Here we go. I don't so even yeah. know if that's a possible oh, question to answer. No, no, I, in, we no, no questions off the uh, off the the board here tonight. No, that's so you'll notice that a lot of times, like on Tom's, like you mentioned in your in your comments, that those are uh, are much more pronounced, right? And especially during uh, when they're when they're strutting during breeding season, that sort of thing. Yeah, say bright tomato colored red. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons why. Um, Benjamin Franklin wanted the wild turkey to be our national bird because yeah, it sort of looked red, white, and blue. Oh, that's <laughs> Not cool. the only reason, but one of yeah. Uh, but yeah, primarily for for display purposes. There, Chris, it's a good question. I have a pet turkey, and I like watching him change all those colors when he's strutting and stuff. It seems like all he ever does anymore is just strut. Cool watching. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Anybody else for Levi and for Adam? Can I ask one more question? Wait, yeah, yes, sorry. I muted myself. Yes, uh, go. Is there a video or anything where I can see the way that Mr. Levi cooked that casserole and stuff? I don't know. Uh, Levi, can you... Um, you have any input I don't there? think there is like a step by step, um, but if you look at the recipe, it's very straightforward. Okay, where can I find that again? Sorry, uh, uh, I can share that. Let me share that again. It's in the comments too, Chris. Uh, it's the planeatmove.com. and when you go there, you can search recipes, and it's uh, Eat Kentucky, Eat Wild Kentucky, I believe. Yeah, cook wild Kentucky. Okay. And again, there's a whole lot of recipes here you can choose from, from baked fish, um, catch of the, well, meatballs. There's numerous recipes here, not only for wild turkey, but about everything else. Okay. Thank you. Levi, thank you again, Chris, for your question. Um, anybody else? Oh, wait, let's see. I think that's, I think that's got us. If, you, if nobody else has any questions, uh, Adam, Levi, you all have been fantastic. I learned a lot. Um, Looking forward to, uh, to trying this out myself. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier or not. I've never actually been turkey hunting before, so uh, can't wait to try it myself it's in the spring. It's quite an experience. <laughs> Anybody else before I end it? Well, folks, remember, uh, I will be sending out a post survey tomorrow. Make sure you, you check that out. Make sure you, you fill it out for us so that we know what we did what we did right and what we did wrong, or rather what Adam and Levi did right and what I did wrong. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll learn from what we did. I uh, want to give a shout out to uh, Miss Becky Wallen. I know she's watching. She's the one that coordinated all of this. So Becky, thank you for that. Um, Gabe, if you're watching Gabe Jenkins too, he's the one that did the step-by-step -step on how to live stream Zoom on YouTube. And then Becky edited it a little bit too. So thank you, Gabe, for that. Uh, and Levi, Adam, Thank you all very, very much. Uh, thank you for having us. Yep, appreciate it. Thank you all for letting us letting us join you all tonight.